On September 8th, 2022, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II died at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, and with her passing came an end of the longest reign of any monarch in British history. It was the end of the Second Elizabethan Age, a period of 70 years, during which time a young princess became queen and took on the role of head of state for Britain and the countries of the Commonwealth. It was a remarkable time of change, not just for Britain, but the whole world politically, culturally, and technologically. Queen Elizabeth II has left an indelible impression on the world with her dedication to duty as the reigning monarch, carrying out her role until her very last days, providing an inspiration to her people even in the darkest of times. However, it should not be forgotten that her duty didn't start with her becoming queen. As a member of the generation that took up the task of staring down the tyranny of fascism in the Second World War, the young Elizabeth, like so many young people, was instilled with a sense of duty to meet the challenges of war. In today's episode, we are going to examine Princess Elizabeth's wartime duties. Welcome to Wars of the World. Given how much we have all come to associate Elizabeth Windsor with being queen, and how seamlessly she stepped into the role, it's easily forgotten that upon her birth she was not in direct line for the throne. Born Princess Elizabeth of York on April 26, 1926 in Mayfair, London, she was the eldest daughter of the then Duke and Duchess of York. It was the Duke's older brother, Edward, who was in line to succeed King George V and so it was presumed that his own children would inherit the throne at the end of his reign. On January 20th, 1936, when Elizabeth was nine years old, Edward ascended to the throne and became Edward VIII. However, his reign was short. His love affair with one Mrs. Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee, shook the British establishment, and with his refusal to leave the woman he loved, on December 11th of that year, he abdicated the throne which then fell to his younger brother, the Duke of York, who from then on would be remembered as King George VI. Overnight, Elizabeth's destiny changed. From that moment onwards, she knew it would be her that would one day inherit the throne from her father and become queen. However, in the meantime, a more pressing crisis loomed as the clouds of war gathered over Europe once more. The horrors of the previous war were still fresh in the minds of much of Britain's middle-aged population, while the younger generation pondered what would be required of them in the coming days, as on September 3rd, 1939, following the invasion of Poland, Britain and France decided enough was enough, and the war with Germany began. The royal family officially elected to remain at Buckingham Palace in London, although they actually alternated time between the palace and Windsor Castle. This helped reassure the people of London that everything possible was being done to protect them from the feared Nazi air raids, while at the same time generated a collective spirit that this was a fight that encompassed every facet of British society, and thus tempered the feelings of resentment among some of the working class concerning the British class system. This was only reinforced when Buckingham Palace itself was bombed, the King and Queen narrowly escaping being killed. The danger from the bombing only prompted calls from the British establishment that Elizabeth and her younger sister Margaret should be evacuated to Canada as a precaution. With so many children being evacuated, there was little to be concerned about regarding the optics of such a move. However, it was the Queen herself who rejected the idea, stating that her children would not leave without her, and she would not leave the King, and he was not going anywhere. Instead, the two princesses were moved to Balmoral in Scotland, which was considered much safer than the southeast of England, before moving to Sandringham, and then finally back to Windsor Castle. In early 1940, the 14-year-old Elizabeth undertook her first major act in support of the war when she appeared on the BBC's Children's Hour radio program to speak to many thousands of evacuees who were leaving the cities and in some cases being transported overseas 
as the Luftwaffe came within reach of mainland Britain. As would become the standard for many a speech she would give afterwards as Queen, she finished with a promise to her people that better days were to come. Before I finish, I can truthfully say to you all that we children at home are full of cheerfulness and courage. We are trying to do all we can to help our gallant sailors, soldiers and airmen. And we are trying too to bear our own share of the danger and sadness of war. We know, every one of us, that in the end all will be well. For God will care for us and give us victory and peace. And when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. Following on from the speech, Elizabeth and Margaret settled into their new wartime lives, mirroring their parents' appearances to raise morale amongst the adult population by addressing the children of Britain. They undertook public visits and were photographed working on the allotment created at Windsor Castle as part of the wider effort known as Dig for Victory, which was intended to reduce Britain's reliance on food imports coming in by sea, where the threat of U-boats was ever present. Some derided these displays as mere propaganda, however the general feeling amongst the wider population was outwardly positive, and indeed inspirational to the children, endearing the young princess to millions at home and abroad. In her teens for much of the war, Elizabeth was ineligible for military service until she turned 18 in 1944. However, her first official duties with the armed forces came two years earlier. On the morning of her 16th birthday in 1942, having been made an honorary colonel of the Grenadier Guards, Elizabeth participated in an inspection of the historic regiment on the grounds of Windsor Castle. Then, a year later, she undertook her first solo engagement when she spent the day with the Grenadier Guards' tank battalion and then, shortly after, assumed the role of President Queen Elizabeth Hospital for children in Hackney, East London. Then, as her 18th birthday approached, there were discussions over her future and what role she would play as she entered into adulthood. Shortly before that point, however, it was decided that she was now of an age where she could replace her father as the monarch should he die of natural causes or, as was still feared, be killed in a German air raid. Thus, she was named as one of four councillors of state, allowing her to act on her father's behalf should he be incapacitated, and in the spirit of this new position and her future role as queen, she undertook her first official duties, acting as head of state when King George VI travelled to inspect British troops fighting in Italy. However, while the war was now going well in the Allies' favour, with American, British and Canadian troops slowly ejecting Hitler's forces from Western Europe back to the Third Reich, Elizabeth was adamant that she should do her part in the forces to aid the war effort and the final defeat of Germany. She made her case for joining one of the women's branches of the British military, but was met with opposition on the grounds that while women were forbidden from combat, she would be placed in unnecessary danger by entering military service and the consequences to the royal family's future if anything were to happen were deemed too great a risk. It was now that Princess Elizabeth showed what type of woman she would be by demonstrating her persistence and tenacity and repeatedly pushing for her to be allowed to join up like so many other women her age. She felt that not only was it her duty to do her part, but that it sent the wrong message if she was forbidden from doing so, even at this late stage of the war. King George VI finally gave in to his daughter's wishes, and so Princess Elizabeth found herself joining up with the British Auxiliary's Territorial Service, or ATS. Formed in 1938 as the threat of war loomed, the ATS was established to allow women to serve in the defense of the nation, and unlike previous organizations, was granted full military status instead of a volunteer service, as had been the case for women before, although they still only received two-thirds the pay as men. All women conscripted for the army were under 30 years old and were unmarried, and were then either selected for the ATS or to train as nurses. 
The old, male-dominated mindset of the British Armed Forces meant that initially roles were limited to cooks, clerks, orderlies, storekeepers, and in the logistics chain. But as Britain's situation grew more desperate, so too did the number of positions that became available for members of the ATS, leading to some 56,000 women serving in various roles, supporting anti-aircraft units in 1943, stopping short of actually firing the guns themselves. For her part, Princess Elizabeth trained as a mechanic and driver, and so traded in her royal finery for drab overalls as she learned the full workings of British Army trucks. She learned how to maintain and repair the engine, change tires, and, of course, drive the often intimidating-looking vehicles. In the lattermost case, her final test came in the form of driving a lumbering old army truck draped in camouflage from the Camberley Army Depot into the middle of London. At first, her position once again threatened to derail her ambitions, and again it was on the grounds of safety, but she insisted she take the exam, and so permission was somewhat reluctantly given. Navigating the heavy London traffic, she drove the truck alone through Piccadilly Circus and onto the finish line of Buckingham Palace itself. Driving the truck through the gates and parking it up, completing her exam without injury, much to the relief of many within the government and her own family. Now a fully signed up member of the ATS, she spent the remaining months of the war balancing her duties to the service and her royal engagements, although often the two went hand in hand, as she was widely photographed as the princess in uniform. However, within just a few months, on May 8th, 1945, the war with Nazi Germany came to an end, following the suicide of Hitler in Berlin and the surrender of Germany's remaining armed forces. In a spontaneous outpouring of joy, thousands of people descended on Buckingham Palace to celebrate and demanded to see the royal family. A short while later, Elizabeth, adorned in her ATS uniform, appeared on the balcony with the King and Queen, as well as her sister and Prime Minister Winston Churchill to rapturous applause. Speaking about that incredible day to the BBC in a 1985 interview, she told how the euphoria that gripped the nation offered a rather unique opportunity for the two princesses. Quote, We asked my parents if we could go out and see for ourselves. I remember we were terrified of being recognized. I remember lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall. All of us swept along on a tide of happiness and relief. It was one of the most memorable nights of my life. While her service in the ATS was comparatively short-lived, her time in uniform gave her a valuable insight into the military world, and throughout the rest of her life, her devotion to those that served in Britain's armed forces was unquestioned, something fueled further by her husband Philip having served in the Royal Navy. When speaking of those days in uniform, she often spoke of them fondly, as she experienced one of the few times in her life where she was largely separate of her family's role in the world and the eventual duties she would be expected to perform. Her knowledge gained from the training also served her well in the years afterwards, and instilled in her an independent streak when it came to driving, with both she and her husband fond of getting behind the wheel of another great British institution, the Land Rover, on the grounds around their estates. Upon stepping down from the Auxiliary Territorial Service, she had reached the rank of Junior Commander, considered broadly equivalent to the male Army Captain. On February 6th, 1952, Princess Elizabeth became Queen Elizabeth II when her father, King George VI, died at Sandringham House, aged just 56, thus beginning the Second Elizabethan Age. In June 2014, Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip attended the 70th anniversary celebrations of the D-Day landings in France. By that time, they were the only remaining heads of state to have served in uniform during the Second World War. And there you have the tale of the princess in uniform. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.